I'm delighted to introduce this morning to you Tony Jones. He is the author of many books, including The Church is Flat, The Relational Ecclesiology of the Emerging Church Movement, and his other book, A Better Atonement Beyond the Depraved Doctrine of Original Sin. I've always wanted to come up with titles like those. Tony is re a theologian in residence at Solomon's Porch in Minneapolis and an adjunct professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. He blogs every day at Theology. He is a speaker and consultant in the areas of emerging church, postmodernism, and Christian spirituality. Please join me in welcoming Tony Jones. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Caroline, it's funny, I grabbed a pew Bible, which is my want, and it's, there's a post-it note in, who knows from when, that says, tell Caroline to stop at 9 a.m. <laughs> right in the post-it note, in the front pew. I mean, Caroline with a K, so I'm telling you, it's you. That's what they're talking about. Um, no such post-it note for me. You know, Lutherans are responsible for post-it notes. Some of you don't know this. This is a Minnesota hagiography that you should all know. Welcome to our fine state. Uh, some Lutheran dude who worked for 3M, I think lived in Rochester, would, as Lutherans do or did at the time, show up at church early and sit through the introit. Is that what it's called? Introit? And uh, as my father used to do, he would rip off little pieces of the bulletin and stick them in uh, as little bookmarks in the hymnal for where all the hymns were for the day so that then he could just open them right up. But then those little bits of bulletin fell on the floor, sullying his sanctuary. And so he thought, there must be a way to make a piece of paper sticky, but not so sticky that it will tear like a piece of tape would tear the hymnal. You know, those hymnal, they put them on real thin paper. Better talk to Augsburg Fortress about that. Uh, so, it's great to be here, and you know, I'm a substitute, and from what I heard, there wasn't a massive um, unregistration after you all got the email about me being the, the substitute speaker today, so uh, I appreciate that, and I'll try not to disappoint. And since I think I went on 15 minutes early, I'll maybe let you out early for lunch, or maybe we'll just use the whole time and have some time for a little uh, Q&A and some response at the end. Uh, so, Caroline, actually, believe it or not, I do usually come up with book titles first, and then the title's so good, I have to write the book. And that's kind of how that subtitle, Beyond the Depraved Doctrine of Original Sin, that's a, a photo taken by the wife of a Lutheran church in Dallas, uh, and it became the cover to my book, The Church is Flat, which, um, and then, you know, this is maybe a subtitle for a conference like this, but my book is about the emerging church movement, and that's the context that I'm going to be speaking from this morning. Uh, my contact information, I guess, is there. Yeah, I blog every day at Patheo, so uh, if you want to follow me, uh, you can all, I assume, at, by, you know, within the next five minutes, I'll have a couple, new, couple hundred new Twitter followers. So go ahead, I'll, I can just take a moment so you can all follow me on Twitter. And uh, I, if you go to Twitter, you'll see that um, I call myself an ecclesiologist. There's a, in Twitter, you can give yourself a very short description, and I call myself an ecclesiologist, and then I define that term that I made up, that an ecclesiologist <laughs> is like a, a proctologist for the church, and... Uh, that video, um, if, if we had more time, a video clip from the movie Fletch, <laughs> where the erstwhile private eye uh, visits his proctologist to get a little information and gets more than he bargained for. I'm going to get right to the point because I have a friend I'm going to bring up in a few moments and we're going to talk through some stuff together in front of you, but I'm going to start by making a few claims. You may disagree with one or more of these claims. If you do, then the proposal that I'm going to make to you about the future of the Preaching Act probably won't hold water. 
Okay? So these are the premises on which I am making my uh, final homiletical or ecclesiological claim. This is the first. This is my theological claim that every human being is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And as such, every human being created in the image of God and indwelt by the Holy Spirit has hermeneutical authority. I'll let that sink in. You may or may not agree with that. You may think that human beings are not indwelt with the Holy Spirit until they receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit or the second baptism if you're Pentecostal. If you are Eastern Orthodox, you probably have no problem with this because you embrace the doctrine of theosis. And for the rest of us Protestants and Catholics, we may be somewhere in the middle or haven't really fleshed out this idea of how much hermeneutical authority does the individual human being have? And I suggest to you, a lot. And, you know, in a house of Luther, that should kind of, um, I should kind of be preaching to the choir on that. That we each have the ability to interpret the sacred text. That's my theological claim. I imagine most of you look out at your congregations on Sunday morning and think, these are people who have the ability to interpret our sacred text. Whether they do it well or not is another question, but they do have that ability. Maybe they don't do it well because, secondly, is my anthropological claim. And that's that most human beings readily and quickly abdicate their hermeneutical authority. This is nothing new. This is what human beings do. This is what they have done. Because our sacred text is not easy. The biblical texts, those 66 books, they are difficult, confusing, ancient, contradictory, full of lingo and terms that we don't use anymore. And so, human beings are apt to look at a clergy person, a bishop, a storefront preacher, a television celebrity, anybody who claims any hermeneutical authority and say, take my hermeneutical authority and tell me what this means. Explain this confusing sacred text to me. And... Well, for generations, clergy have wholeheartedly embraced that hermeneutical authority. Awesome! Almost as though they were reading Max Weber's texts, predicting what would happen. Clergy have said, you pay me, I will figure out what this text means, and I will deliver a monologue to you on Sunday morning that will explain it. Because it is tricky. So I'm going to go to a special school. And I'm going to learn those funny languages that you'll never learn. And I'm going to buy lots of important looking books that are going to line the shelves of my study. And they're going to help me interpret the text. And I'm going to sit on Thursday morning or Saturday evening and I'm going to come up with something and I'm going to deliver it on Sunday morning. And I'm going to wear a microphone and the lights are going to shine on me and you are going to sit and listen. You're not going to raise your hand. You're not going to talk back. If you argue, maybe you'll argue with your partner on the drive home. And some of us in the more progressive versions of American Protestantism, we wring our hands at the growth of evangelical megachurches. And as a, like a practical theologian who studies congregations, let me tell you that a lot of what those churches deliver on is this. I will tell you what this text means. 
no nuance, no shades of gray. I'm going to give it to you straight. I'm going to tell you how to vote. I'm going to tell you whom to marry. I'm going to tell you where to spend your money. This is what human beings do. And whether it's to a bishop or a clergy person in a collar or a Pentecostal storefront preacher or David Koresh, it's an abdication of hermeneutical authority by parishioners to a clergy class of people. Now my sociological claim is that we live in interesting times. We live in a time in which we don't know from whence hermeneutical authority comes. Do you think the people in your parishes would defer to a biblical interpretation simply because the presiding bishop said, this is what we believe? Or the district superintendent says that? Or the clergy person says that? When I was uh, growing up, no, when, let's just say this. When my grandparents were around, the United States White House press corps would not show the president of the United States in a wheelchair. Because it would show some kind of weakness during a time when we didn't want to show the present in weakness. This is one of the very few photographs actually available of FDR in a wheelchair. That was just kind of an arrangement or an agreement that the US press corps had with the White House. I grew up in an era of Saturday Night Live in which, come on, somebody may have to click that for me. Oh, there we go. In which Chevy Chase pretended to be Gerald Ford and tripped over Christmas trees and tripped coming out of Air Force One. And Dan Aykroyd was Richard Nixon on 60 Minutes. And we started to think of Richard Nixon more as the Dan Aykroyd caricature, right? Than of Richard Nixon himself. My children are growing up in an era where the president isn't just mocked on Saturday nights during a late night monologue or, or a, a weekend news update, but every night, every night, John Stewart and Stephen Colbert are going after the president, senators, making fun of congressmen, making fun of clergy persons and bishops. And my children and your children and grandchildren are being raised in possibly the most participatory era of human information ever. Yeah, yeah, I bet here at Luther Seminary, students don't get to use footnotes from Wikipedia, right? How long do you think that's going to last, honestly? How long before we hit some tipping point in, in uh, academic institutions and Wikipedia is seen as as authoritative as any other non-objective source for information in our world, which they all are. So suddenly we're in this strange position. From Jonathan Edwards' day, in which the clergyman was the most educated person in the village and an authority on pretty much every topic to now when we are one of the crowd. I asked, uh, I, I was on staff at Colonial Church in Edina, which is uh, my home church, uh, many years ago, 10 years ago, and I asked my senior pastor about why um, this one man who had been very high up in committees uh, and was a very kind of powerful person in the Twin Cities, and, and was like, he would come to church council meetings, but he never came to worship. And I asked the senior pastor, how, do you, how come you think this guy never comes to worship? He says, men who are that powerful don't sit and listen to other men tell them how to live their lives for 23 minutes on Sunday. And on and on it goes, right? 
hermeneutical authority, I argue to you, is something that we now need to divest ourselves of as clergy and instead build up communities that are hermeneutically authoritative in and of themselves. So here's my ecclesiological claim. You could say it's my homiletical claim. The future of preaching is not monological. It's not doing what I'm doing now. So let me just, like... Let me just cut the knees off from that criticism right now if some of you sit down with me at lunch and say, well, you just did exactly what you said not to do. That's right. You know why? Because I was hired and paid money to do this, and you, and you paid money to do this. There is a contract between us. They give me a microphone. The lights are pointed this way. They plug in my computer, not yours, to go up there. Right. That's how it goes. That's the contract. So I'm delivering a monologue now with my voice electronically amplified. But I don't think that's the future of com Christian community formation. I think that the future, here's my little term for it, it's called rolling communal midrash. And it's what we try to do at Solomon's Porch in South Minneapolis on a weekly basis. And here's what I mean by each of those terms. And then I'm going to show you a brief video so you get a little feel of Solomon's Porch. And then introduce my friend and we're going to go meta on you. Rolling. Our community is working our way through the Bible. Not in Genesis to maps order. We... Pause for laughter. That's an easy preacher joke, by the way. Okay? You can, you can use it. We go from this book, and then we jump over to that book, and when we do the Hebrew Scripture, and then we do the Christian Scripture, and we've done John three times, and Jude one time. But what we're doing is we're building an interpretive community. I would say this, we are building a midrash of the text at Solomon's Porch. Our community is rolling our way through the Bible since the community was founded 12 years ago. And we have, on Sunday evenings, a conversation about the text. So the text goes up on the screen... Somebody in the congregation reads the part that's up on the screen. The person in the center asks a question, throws out a comment, and people respond. They raise their hands, they shout something out, they snap, because we found out one time when somebody from our church uh, came back from some time in Egypt that students in Egypt, when, I, when they want to get the teacher's attention, they snap. It's not considered rude, so we just decided... At Solomon's Porch, it's not rude to snap at somebody. So somebody snaps, they're called on, they say, what about this? I always heard it was this way. But wait, last month when we were talking about this, didn't that word come up then? People have their laptops open, and they say, I just been looking this up on Wikipedia, and I don't think the Greek means what you think it means. <laughs> okay, really? Let's hear. What does it say on Wikipedia? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, that puts a little bit different spin on it than we thought. And then we kind of work our way through that paragraph of the text, and then the next paragraph of the text comes up, and on it rolls, on it rolls. It's communal because we do it both on Tuesday nights at a Bible discussion group that goes for two to three hours, and then we do it on Sunday evenings on that same text for 40, 45 minutes in a group of 150, 200 people. And we don't do it alone. We realize that if we're really in dialogue and conversation about our sacred text, we can't do it alone, which means it shouldn't just be this insular community. So we invite other voices, the voices of church history into it. And as you'll meet my friend Rabbi Edelheit in a moment, we have a rabbi in residence, and he and I often co-preach together. You probably wouldn't call it preaching if you saw what we do. Co-discussion leading or something. We call it the sermon. 
but it's not monological. Uh, we did it, for instance, on uh, last Palm Sunday. I don't know how many of you all had rabbis preach on Palm Sunday. <laughs> Hands? We did. I'm not saying it to brag. A little bit to brag. And uh, there happened to be a, a, a filmmaker from the Twin Cities in, uh, at, at Solomon's Porch that evening, and he shot some video, which um, we've got here with a song from our community. We write all of our own music. And so before Rabbi Edelheit joins me up here, I want to show you this video to give you a sense, and you'll see the two of us uh, in the video. That would have barely fed the kid You were there to feed our hungry people To show you give us daily bread And as the bread was broken, did you win? Knowing your hour would be Be ahead. Be ahead. The sand was hot beneath your feet. And you didn't eat for forty days. When you were weak, Satan came to tempt you, saying. I dare you to turn this stone to bread You came to feed a hungry people So we don't live on bread alone I know you God, but do you ever wonder Why we ease our hunger Eating stone Rabbi, how to speak and touch your heart, you would know above all others how to finish what we can't start. Okay, well, uh, that's Solomon's Porch in a you know, three-minute video clip made to look us, make us look really awesome uh, with good music and everything. And here's Rabbi Joseph Edelheit, who's a good friend of mine. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> Today, uh, I, I had to look in the Talmud, and uh, the Talmud says that if you spend half the day studying, it's in lieu of being in the synagogue, because today is the first day of Sukkot. So I uh, told my kids I was going over to Luther to spend Sukkot morning, and they said, figures. I have uh, the great honor of holding the Price Award, 
which Luther gave me with Father Michael O'Connell. It was a millennial gift. Uh, Luther figured that on the millennium, if it gave a rabbi and a Catholic priest a public award for religious leadership, we might get another millennium out of it. (laughs) I'm observing the 20th year of being in Minneapolis. Came here in 92 to become the senior rabbi at Temple Israel, Minneapolis. I uh, retired in uh, 2001 because my cardiologist kept asking me after an emergency four-way bypass, what part of serving 6,000 Jews and the word lethal are you missing? (laughs) From uh, 2002 until today, I've been at St. Cloud State University, where I chair uh, Jewish studies and religious studies. I went there as part of a federal class action lawsuit following uh, anti-Semitism. Members of Temple Israel said, you retired from Temple to go to St. Cloud? (laughs) And I said, sometimes it's easier when you know exactly who is. I taught at Valparaiso University from 1976 to 1984. My doctorate is from the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. At one point, I was the only rabbi to have gotten a doctorate in Christian theology. Studied with Marty, Tracy, and Ricoeur of blessed memory. Midrash. Uh, I love it when Christians borrow but don't ask to share. No, 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 no. He asked. That's the point. Midrash comes from the Hebrew word lead drosh to extract exegesis. I know a lot of you go to the underground course which is required, eisegesis, that's different than the required course that's taught in the classroom, exegesis. I've spent 40 years in my ministry and I'm always checking to make sure there is a text that comes prior to the sermon rather (laughs) than a sermon for which I did some surfing to find a text. And that goes to the point of what does it mean when Christians do Midrash? If you don't go to the Hebrew Bible text and look at the Hebrew Bible, parenthetical editorial. It is the Hebrew Bible. We share it. It isn't the Old Testament. When I teach my course at St. Cloud, I only use the two letters OT so that I can know I'm referring to the only testament. (laughs) Seriously. Go out and buy yourselves the Jewish Study Bible, Oxford Press. It has the newest translation of the Hebrew text into 21st century English with commentary. If you use the Hebrew text, we can discuss whether or not you're willing to do Midrash. That's where it begins. If you use the Old Testament, you've lost the hermeneutical authority. No, no, that it begins there. King James, blessed be the 400 years of totally destroying a text. I require the Jewish study Bible because when we get to Exodus 3, it leaves 
ehiye asher, ehiye untranslated. So students are always saying, well, Edelheit, you, you mean the Hebrew doesn't have a translation? Not that Hebrew. But it's I am that I am. No, please. <laughs> I am that I am is impossible to get out of the Hebrew. You cannot conjugate first person participle of the verb to be. It does not exist. Maybe I will be that I will be. Larry Kushner is better. I will be that which I have yet to become. Or we could just model, as I've done at Solomon's Porch. It doesn't translate. Once you get to that, okay, let's talk about your doing midrash. Solomon's Porch invited me to become their rabbi in residence after lots of conversations, Doug Padgett, Tony, were they willing? For four months, I taught Torah at the church every Thursday night. Doug was getting worried. More people were coming to Torah classes. <laughs> and... So let's do this yeah, thing. So, so here's the deal. When you have a brilliant rabbi as a good friend of yours, you get to call and say, I want to work through this text with you. And if he happens to have a doctorate in Christian theology, you can actually use the Christian scriptures, and he knows exactly uh, what he's talking about. So, I'm going to read the text from which I will preach tomorrow morning at 11, and then we are going to come up with a sermon in front of you, and then also with you. Okay? Because... I already discovered, based on our phone conversations over the last week, that I was a bit misguided in my interpretation of the text. I'll put up a little icon to give you something pretty to look at while I read this very familiar text to you from Mark chapter 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. For they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Now, Rabbi, in, in Mark, one of the things I've always been intrigued, or for a long time been intrigued by this passage, because of the way Mark edits it, because in Mark we have the first gospel, the most primitive gospel, the gospel with the least editorializing by the author. It's, it's pretty much a, just a straight-up account of what went on. There's not a lot of kind of omniscient narrator going on in the Gospel of Mark. It's get to the point in Mark. But in Mark, probably more than any other Gospel, Peter plays a significant role as a literary device. He's, Peter is kind of every man. Peter is bumbling his way into some kind of belief in the Messiah, asking the questions that everybody wants to ask and then being reprimanded, get behind me Satan by Jesus and kind of put in his place. But here we have in the transfiguration, which clearly is kind of a pivotal moment in the narrative, right before they turn their faces to go up to Jerusalem, 
And Peter says something to Jesus in the midst of this account. And it is the only time that I can find in which somebody says something directly to Jesus, makes a claim on him, reaches out for him, asks a question of him, and Jesus does not respond. And it's almost as though Mark thinks, well, this is so weird, I have to say something. Like the NIV puts it in parentheses after Peter's statement, it's good for us to be here, Rabbi, let's put up three tabernacles, tents, dwellings, we'll talk about that. Uh, And then in parentheses, as the NIV puts it, like an aside from the narrator, he was so scared he didn't know what to say. And then the cloud descends. Jesus never responds. So odd to me that Mark would see fit to include this. It must have importance, or he just would have left out, like he surely left out all the other stuff they said. For instance, holy crap! Like he didn't put... They said that, I'm guessing. Holy scubalon. You can use that one too. They did, Mark didn't put that in there, but he puts in this comment by Peter. So, I'm wondering what it is about this statement. Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three. And I've got the Greek word. Skenos. All right, so <clears throat> lots of things immediately are stimulated. I say every Tuesday and Thursday morning in my Bible class, all you ever have is the text. You don't have anything else. But the minute you come to a text, you are required to engage in context. There is no text without a context. Part of the context is translation. Part of the context is that it's a text at all. The Bible was oral, oral. Oral, oral. We make the mistake of constantly referring to it as a book, a text. It has been a text far shorter than it has been oral, oral. Second context, the context that you, as the listener reader, bring to the engagement with the text. My teacher, Paul Ricoeur of Blessed Memory, in his own presence, channeling Gadamer, would always demand of us, all right, don't tell me what you think and tell me until you can tell me what the bias is through which you are thinking that. They went up to a mountain, red lights, bells, Everything in the Bible coming from this topography, anything of importance, happens on mountains. Common theme, very important. After six days, yeah, it's pretty obvious. Elijah, one of two characters who doesn't die, the harbinger of the messianic age, Moses, who also spent a lot of time on the mountain and didn't go into the land. Gotta spend some time getting ready to read. Don't start reading. Get ready to read. Can't read the Bible with one text in front of you. Got to have lots of texts. Now let's deal with that. So, Pastor, was Mark a Greek speaking intertestamental <laughs> Judean? 
Well, Mark was obviously a Greek uh, speaker and writer, but of course we know that he is translating what he has been told they said on this mountain, this okay. pericope, right? He tra he's translating it into Greek. From? Aramaic. Oh! Take a moment and bring Mel Gibson's presence to you. <laughs> All right. So, we've got a problem with translation. What do you do with translation? No, that is a significant issue that needs to be thrown back into the rolling communal act of exegesis. So Midrash deals with that word. Is it what actually appeared? Or was it an Aramaicized idiom of sukkah? He and I have been going back and forth, several emails, phone calls. He's going to preach tomorrow on Tabernacle. I've begged him not to. <laughs> so, so let's talk about how we get here. So I think of this text, I'm thinking of it theologically, and I think, well, there's something, what's so intriguing to me about this text is that Rabbi Jesus he, he, not, he doesn't only, he doesn't even, even put Peter aside and say, Peter, dumb suggestion. I don't have time for building tabernacles or tents or shelters or dwellings. I have stuff to do. Down the mountain we go, we're headed to Jerusalem. And that the Christian, well, the human inclination is... Something spiritual happened here. This is a thin place. Let's put up a tabernacle. Let's raise an Ebenezer. Let's build a hill of foreskins. Like, let's... <laughs> so, okay. No rabbi would ever use that tagline. <laughs> let's commemorate. Let's commemorate this. We, we can't let this slip away into the vapor. Right. And... and Jesus, but, but, but notice, he already, God love him, is predisposed to a Christian theological question. Midrash means backup. Gadamer asks, if you're standing looking at Guernica, Picasso's great triptych, how far away from Guernica should you stand to see all of it? Huh. Oh, uh, you don't have to read the 20 pages. The answer is out in the hall. <laughs> no, no, but, but that's exactly why they've invited a rabbi into the rolling communal midrash. Here, here's my take. My take is that you have a tale that was well known. You invite eschatological figures, Elijah and Moses, both unrequited. Hmm. And the people hearing the tale, hearing the tale, not reading the parable, would have appreciated, I understand what a sukkah is, that's what you put up for the Feast of Tabernacles immediately following Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Four days after Yom Kippur. Uh, I do believe it is the Levitical act of sacrifice that is played out for ultimate atonement. Makes more sense to me than replaying ex Exodus 25 through about the tabernacle, the desert indwelling. So it's the sukkah. Uh, we all know what sukkot are. You don't. No, no, here's an important problem. You're Christians. <laughs> no, no, 
but, but the nature of what that word probably references was to Judeans who were in that slippery, fluid reality of post-biblical Israelite culture emerging rabbinic Judaism. All of those people were not yet Christians. <laughs> you read this and you go to, I got it, I, I understand, this is the transfiguration, it teaches me blah, blah, blah. But I think it was included in the fluidity of the oral text so that a sukkah cannot be permanent, it must be fragile with three sides open on top. You must see the harvest moon of the last two nights. It rains on Sukkot. It always rains. It's the early fall harvest, which is defined theologically as the wanderings. It is called Zman Simchatenu, the time of our rejoicing. Well, wait a minute. Wanderings, rejoicing. Oh, because we got everything we needed, but not everything we wanted. What if the rabbi doesn't respond because merely saying, I want to build three Sukkot, one for you, Lord, one for Moses and one Elijah, we get that. We understand immediately. The dwellings are to be temporary, fragile, and then we move on. Jesus doesn't respond because immediately everyone in that community understands the language. That, to me, precedes the theology of transfiguration and the silence of Jesus. Okay, so let me ask you this. This was, if, if, uh, if our timing is right, he's not saying, let's build these two sukkah during Sukkot. Right. So how inappropriate is that for Peter to say that kind of out of the time of the appropriate festival for those Well, dwellings? first, there are a lot of things regarding dating that you all collectively don't seem to agree upon. Right, but Mark is laying this out in such a way that it's just a short time before Passover. Regardless of no, when no. it really happened, all we have is the text. Right. And the text says, not during Sukkot. Good. And, and so now we have a conflict. Don't solve the conflict. Okay. Midrash says, out of the ambiguity and the conflict come the questions. Midrash and sermons are about questions. The actual creation of sermonics is always anchored in questions. It runs antithetical to the brilliant insights. No, no, I mean, it was an extraordinary PowerPoint. Everything he said, not only did I agree with and learn from, but why isn't it taught at every seminary? The, the issue is people want answers. That's not what the sages provide. The sages aren't about answers. Answers shut down conversations. Let's go to the participle rolling. When, when I get a call from Tony or I get a call from Doug, really, what, what's going on? Yeah, well, could you, and right here and So, it's out of order. I got a question about being out of order. How come you follow or assume Christmas from the synoptics in winter, but not springtime from John? 
Oh, I know the answer. Because December is a downtime. <laughs> and she, he who controls the calendar, controls the community. Which is by, by the way, Hanukkah is also added. Maccabees 1, 2, 3, 4 aren't in my scripture. Got three seasonal agricultural pilgrimage festivals. Leviticus 23. Oops, nothing for the winter. Except what those crazy people were doing running through the forests with torches throwing wine because it was the solstice period. So, he's right, we got a problem. The holidays are out of order. So ask the question and leave it unanswered. I don't know how to answer it. I tell my students, when you deal with the text of the Bible, you have two choices, fact or truth. If you choose facts, you will often be asked to give up truth. If you choose truth, please make your peace with conflict. Hmm. So, um, how you see this text, and we're going to hear a sermon actually this afternoon from Lauren about Sukkot, so we're going to delve a little more into that. Um, Final question about this text. If tomorrow for my sermon, my, my theological takeaway from this text is Jesus doesn't even have time for the temporary dwellings for himself, Moses, and Elijah. This text is obviously rife with theological meaning to first century Jewish hearers of it. And... Uh, do you think from, from where you stand and your understanding of Sukkot that uh, that's an appropriate reading of the text? That that may well be why Jesus doesn't respond to Peter and immediately leaves the mountain? Yeah, that asked me this old, old, naive issue that I can understand the text better than the author. And uh, I don't think any postmodern person wants to embrace that naivete. Uh, I don't know, Tony. I, I too am fascinated by the silence. Now, what if, uh, as with so many other elements of Christian scripture, uh, we're not dealing with a factual recounting? <laughs> I, I understand. I taught at Valpo. I get the whole inerrancy thing. But there is the possibility this is not simultaneous reportage. So what if the silence of Jesus is a way for the text to remind us that there was a discourse available at that time that is no longer accessible right. to us. Oh, wow. So Peter, I'll use his nice postmodern literary discourse, the every person. Mm -hmm. Peter, the every person asks the rhetorical question, well, don't you want to hang for a while? To which there is no answer. The no answer is where the sermon begins. Instead of going backwards and assuming we can figure out why there's no answer. What, what would it be like if we use this text to talk about the number of times we ask and for which there are no answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 
here's why I sign up for coming here instead of putting my talit on and going to Davin to pray on Sukkot. Because I learned at Valparaiso when, when I wrote so many letters of reference to LSTC and 801 and I won't know what one or two future Luther, Lutheran ministers might be able to better appreciate about the fact that Jews are still here. That, that's why I'm a rabbinic resident at an emergent church in Minneapolis. It, it, you have no idea the wealth I get from the salary they provide. <laughs> It's better than being emeritus at Temple Israel. No, no, because there are Christians who have now taken me seriously because I take them seriously. That is what Midrash is about. The Gospels are a form of Midrash. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do the Midrash from which you are reading Midrash, do what they did. Know the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> they didn't have Christian scripture because they were writing it. No, no, that really is important. The Gospels don't come from a Christian context. They come from the fluidity of that context that precedes the Christian context. So, for me, the fact that there is no answer is why we're in dialogue. If there were an answer, okay, he's got another brilliant, quippy, somewhat edgy way of looking at the issue of the transfiguration. Okay, but the text remains closed, not open. The, the goal of Midrash is to keep the text open. So, here, here's my theory, and I, I thought about this for the last week. Jesus is crucified and dies. The temple is destroyed in 70. Just about the time some guy named Mark is getting this first whatever it is, out into the open. Mm -hmm. Another 20 years, 90, small town outside of Jerusalem, Yavna, where Yohanan ben Zakkai puts the canonization of the Hebrew Bible together. In that 20 years, can you imagine the conversations? Oh, what an amazing set of dinner parties. No, no, because I want to be at the dinner party where they're discussing, yeah, no, really, Esther and Song of Songs. Yeah, they don't mention God, but, no, they're popular. <laughs> no, no, popular with a small p, no kitsch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're really popular. They come from the people. Mm -hmm. That's what's behind the story in Mark. I think they sat at Yavna the way Mark did 20 years before. They came up with the following. The temple is gone, the priesthood is gone, we're all going into the diaspora. By this time it was clear also that Christianity would be Gentile and not Jewish. Diasporic faith. We are still all committed to one God to which we now must shift and be committed to one text. The commitment is to one text because the temple is gone, the priesthood is gone. We have to redevelop the grist for the mill. I think the story of the transfiguration, which is so important to Christians, is so you're going to have this guy who I now have an image of before I have an image of him. And he's going to be 
transfigured on a mountain, which is where all great things happen. You have to use language that the people who listened to the story would have understood. None of you would have been in that group. As long as the text stays open, we've got a dialogue. If you close the text on me, you go Christology on me, you, you, you're heavy-handed with that unfortunate, not-so-nuanced antinomianism, I'm locked out. Mm. There, there's no room for midrash in that. So, he's the new generation. No, he really is. And the fact that he and I, we found each other in a, you tell him the story. We found each other in the Nashville airport. That's like a country song. Yeah. We should probably write a country song. <laughs> I came hobbling into the Delta Lounge in the Nashville airport. I couldn't stand up straight. And he said, looks like you need back surgery. And uh, I was self-medicating with vodka in the, in the, in the Delta. And we, that, that uh, launched this friendship. So, to often, I have to self-medicate with vodka. No, by the way, when he was no longer in need of self-medicating, he called me anyway. So, so look, we have, we have a few minutes before lunch, and so I, I really do, um, some of you may have questions, because honestly, the, um, we've been doing this. We've been kind of recapping conversation that we've had over the last week and going into some new areas, and then I am left with, you know, writing a homily, a 12-minute homily for tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., which I will say is not what we would ever do at Solomon's Porch, right? But, I mean, I'll do it because that's the contract no, at a, at a place like this. Paid. Right, yeah, that's the contract, right? But at Solomon's Porch, that's not what we do. So some of you may have questions about, at a place like Solomon's Porch, what does it mean to do, what are the mechanics of the preaching act when it is dialogical with the community. And I know some of you have done dialogical sermons, but what I'm not talking about is turn to your neighbor and talk for 60 seconds about this question. And then it, it's not, dialogue for us is not a gimmick to keep people engaged. Dialogue is our homiletical act. It's what we do. We collectively interpret the text. And so as we've been doing this, we've looked around and said, there are some people who've been collectively interpreting the text for millennia, and they have a term for it called midrash. And so we ask authorities, can we share that term? Like, what can we learn in our Christian community, which many of us believe is, you know, a continuation of the Lord's communication with, interaction with Israel. Now we're grafted into that. May we jump up on that platform of Midrash with you. And what it does is it keeps the text open. It doesn't, uh, it keeps us from foreclosing hermeneutical possibilities in the text because there's already a tradition of a rolling Midrash uh, in Judaism. So, um, because we have a couple minutes before lunch, if they're in, yeah, snap away and ask a question. We, yes and yes. We do it before and we do it during. And, what we, and the difference at Solomon's Porch is because the contract with the people around us in, at 360 degrees is people will raise their hands and... Uh, the last, uh, the last time we did it together, as I stepped down, the bass player of the band, uh, he was standing up to start the next song, and he said, when I see you two do that, I think that must be what it's like to ride a wild stallion. And maybe you get a little sense of that. And I'm, you can decide who's the stallion and who's the rider, right? <laughs> who's got the mane? Please, who's got the mane? But please don't tell us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, celebration 
Go ahead. You go first. Uh, Good question. Good I, question. I was invited to speak uh, five times in the Chapel of the Resurrection uh, at Valpo. The year I retired from Valpo, I was invited to preach. Hmm. Uh, the dean of the chapel of sainted thought um, walked out in the middle of my sermon and later said, uh, you don't believe in Jesus, therefore you cannot preach the word. My answer was, that's right, but by your standards, Jesus couldn't have preached the word either. <laughs> so, um, the, the question becomes somewhat Lutheran doctrine, uh, that the word does become flesh, and I regard and respect that highly, this may not be for every Sunday, but it does open the text in a way that the uh, monological becomes less the shoved pattern. Um, I, I think it's very, very important that Christians are given an opportunity to see a Jew not merely hear that Jesus was one. I teach at a school where overwhelmingly I am the first Jew most of my students ever meet. So, I, I hear you and I regard your question as a sacred question. I am not suggesting that you back away, I as a rabbi, but I am fine being a teacher for the purpose of, quote, preaching. If it was good enough for the sages, it's good enough for me. But I, I'm not a Lutheran, and I know what he says in his confession. So. My, my response is similar from, obviously, a different background. And, you know, I grew up at Colonial Church in Edina, which when I was being raised in that church, there was a preaching minister and a teaching minister. Like right out of Calvin's institutes, there are two offices and they are distinct. Um, and I had a great deal of respect for that growing up and it was very clear the preaching minister preached and the teaching minister led Bible studies and occasionally preached. Uh, I now think that dichotomy is overplayed I don't think uh, that Bible study is not proclamation, and I don't think that preaching is not educational and teaching. So are those two conflated at Solomon's Porch as we have our open... Yeah, there would probably be... I mean, uh, I, I can tell you this, that for a lot of you to visit Solomon's Porch would be, especially if you visited over a series of weeks, it would be shocking for you in that it would seem probably, traditionally speaking, that there is no proclamation. There has never in 12 years, to my knowledge, ever been an application, ever once. We do not apply what we learn from the text. At least that's not done uh, verbally by somebody in a position of authority. That's done as the community uh, lives it out. So I think the answer to your question is from, from where we sit at Solomon's Porch, those, uh, those traditional categories have collapsed into one another. Yeah, I mean, it really does, rec what, what, what I'm suggesting and what Joseph and I are together doing really is challenging many of the assumptions because what you have to start to do is you start to peel away the layers of the onion, right? And you heard in my opening remarks some not-so-subtle jabs at what I call the clergy class of people. And so it's funny, you know, you, you, you'll go to some, uh, some sects within uh, American Protestantism and they'll say, uh, we don't believe in ordination. So, like, nobody here is ordained. Everybody's a lay leader. Well, we don't. We actually ordain everybody. We do the opposite. We think everybody is ordainable, and we ordain everybody whenever they ask to, be, to ordain them into ministry. 
Uh, the, the thing about it is, uh, now, now, don't, now don't hear me saying, here's one thing that, that, that I'd like you to have clear in your mind and think about. It's one thing to say that we're renegotiating authority. And we're saying the hermeneutical authority lies in the community as it's constituted. That's very different than saying we're, there's no such thing as leadership. Because as you might imagine, to sit in the middle of 150 people and have a public conversation that's just the two of us and then other people chiming in, that takes a certain amount of homiletical leadership, you might say. Now, it's a very different kind of leadership than writing a manuscript and delivering it well with good eye contact and nice enunciation. It's very different, but it's still leadership. But what it does is it, it's constantly, as I was saying earlier, trying to divest ourselves of hermeneutical authority and force that back onto the laps of everyone in the community so that we're in this together. Yeah. Yeah, and in, in Calvin's Institutes, there are actually the two offices are preaching and teaching are separate offices in the church, according to Calvin. And I'm just saying that, like, I, went, I, I was reared in a church that was very traditional to that concept. And that church isn't even traditional to that concept anymore. We'll go here and then go back there. Yeah. Mm. Yes, uh -huh. and <clears throat> I am that I am has destroyed Exodus 3. Literally destroyed the text. That's not what the burning bush is about. I am that I am is static, one-dimensional, but requiring students to read from a text in which Ehiah Asher Ehiah is not translated. My students know I, the word angel cannot be used in my classroom. Malach, messenger. Hmm. Why? Because the word angel is so hallmarkized. Hmm. And, and therefore, if you say the word angel, you always only think of the last place you saw some kitschy crap. No, but that opens the text. I don't know what it is. Can we say, I don't know? All I have is the text. The translation is already hermeneutical authority. So. I, if all I ever have is the text, why would I want to shut it down and limit it? Uh, we, I'm sorry, I know there's some more questions, but time is up. I know, I hate that when that happens to me too. It's 11.45 and we don't want to be responsible for putting everything on a, on, you know, on a late 12 track. 12.45. But, but let me say this. When we when we go into the middle of Solomon's porch and sit down on those two stools surrounded by the community, no, uh, back to Sandy's question, we don't know where we're going to end up 45 minutes later. We've talked on the phone about it. We've maybe shot each other a couple emails. You should read this. Oh, I just, I, photo I scan this, read this PDF from this rabbinic text that I copied for you. I read it. We talk. But very, we do very minimal prep kind of like today. We sit down in the middle of the community, we open the text on screens, and we work through it. The two of us in a collective of dozens of people who care about the text and are invested in the ongoing midrash of that community. So, um, And by the way, yeah. that is what happened in the first century. They sat and they engaged the text. And they got to where they got 
at that point, you go to another midrash, they're someplace else. I thank you once again for allowing me to share in this and uh, wish you well. Thank you.